Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In 1991, Beverly Allett used her authority as a hospital nurse to take the lives of four young victims and attempt to murder or grievously harm nine others. Britain was on high alert when young children, some just babies, were suddenly going into cardiac arrest without explanation. But when nursing logs went missing under Allett's watch, authorities were called to investigate. She would later be dubbed the Angel of Death on account of her many crimes. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… It was John Wilkes Booth who assassinated President Abraham Lincoln, but Booth had an assassin as well coming after him. Many haunted locations are popular with ghost hunters and fans of the paranormal, but what if your business is being destroyed because ghosts are scaring off your customers? Imagine having a strange dream about being in the hospital and the doctors taking a blood sample from you. Then you wake up in bed to find a needle mark in your arm, and your spouse has one too. A contractor tells his personal story of a strange creature he came across while working with the U.S. Navy and NATO in 1954 Spain. We've all had songs stuck in our heads at one time or another, but what happens when it's a name that gets stuck in your brain? A name you haven't heard in decades. But first, Beverly Allett was a children's nurse and also one of Britain's most notorious killers. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Beverly Allett's troubling behavior can be traced back to her childhood. As a young girl, she went to extreme lengths to garner attention. Not only would she fake illnesses and wear bandages when she didn't have any real wounds to cover, but she'd also make frequent visits to the hospital when she wasn't sick. Supposedly, she even forced a doctor to remove her appendix when there was nothing wrong with it. She was also known to physically harm herself for attention, using anything from glass shards to a hammer to inflict injury. Such acts are often signs of Munchausen syndrome a factitious disorder wherein an individual feigns or induces trauma to draw attention or sympathy. Yet when pretending to be sick or injuring herself wasn't enough, Allett moved on to hurting others around her. And when she began to train as a local nurse at Lincolnshire's Grantham and Kestevan Hospital, the true terror began. That's where Allett began working in the children's ward and found her first victim Liam Taylor. Taylor was only seven months old when she was admitted to the hospital for an infection in the chest. Young Taylor's illness only got worse under Allett's care, which eventually caused him to stop breathing and have a heart attack. He later died on February 23, 1991. The following month, another child would suffer thanks to Allett. At only 11 years old, Timothy Hardwick already had a hard life, suffering from both cerebral palsy and epilepsy. 
but it was Alec's hand that eventually caused his death on March 5th. Keely Desmond was Alec's next target. She also arrived at the hospital with a chest infection. Initially, she seemed to be on the mend. On March 8th, however, the one-year-old girl went into cardiac arrest while under Alec's care. Attendants were able to resuscitate Kaylee and transferred her to another hospital, where an unexplained puncture mark was found on her body. Although it did raise alarm, the puncture did not lead to a police investigation. Three more emergencies took place on the ward in the weeks that followed, each involving Nurse Allett. Death then struck in the case of newborn Becky Phillips. On April 1, 1991, Becky Phillips was admitted to the hospital under Allett's care for gastroenteritis. A few days later, Becky was released from the hospital, only to die at home. Six more children would suffer some sort of life-threatening emergency under Allett's watch. Sadly, Claire Peck did not survive. The 15-month-old with a serious asthma condition was the final child killed by Allett when she was admitted into the hospital and put on a breathing tube. The young girl suffered not one, but two heart attacks while Allett was taking care of her. The second attack caused the toddler's untimely death on April 22, 1991. Later, it was revealed the child's potassium level was sky-high. She had also been given a drug called linocaine, which helps treat irregular heartbeats, but only in adult patients, never in infants. In November 1991, Allett was charged after the nursing logs went missing in her ward. Soon, some of the missing logs would be found inside Allett's home during a police search, confirming their suspicion. When authorities checked into the nurse's background, they learned of her alarming need for attention and diagnosed her as suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy a factitious disorder closely related to Munchausen syndrome wherein the afflicted fabricates or instigates trauma in an involuntary individual to generate sympathy. During her trial, Alec continued to show signs of her attention-seeking illness. She lost an incredible amount of weight from starving herself and was later diagnosed with anorexia. On May 23, 1993, Alec was convicted of murdering four children attempting to murder another three, and causing grievous bodily harm with intent to a further six. She was given 13 life sentences, but would not serve them in prison. Instead, she was assigned to Nottingham's Rampton Secure Hospital, where she currently resides today. Coming up, imagine having a strange dream about being in the hospital and the doctors taking a blood sample from you. Then you wake up in bed to find a needle mark in your arm, and your spouse has one too. Plus, a contractor tells his personal story of a strange creature he came across while working with the U.S. Navy and NATO in 1954 Spain. And we've all had songs stuck in our heads at one time or another, but what happens when it's a name that gets stuck in your brain, a name you haven't heard in decades? But first, Many haunted locations are popular with ghost hunters and fans of the paranormal, but what if your business is being destroyed because ghosts are scaring off your customers? That story and more when Weird Darkness returns. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help 
help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. For many supposedly haunted locations, the possibility of encountering the paranormal can be a huge draw for tourists and their sweet, sweet tourist cash. For those who believe or want to believe, any chance to experience something supernatural is alluring. For others, though, it seems that the prospect of encountering members of the spirit realm can be a turnoff, a big one. And for tourist attractions which depend on regular visitors, that can be a huge problem. The Okabella Homestead, a popular tourist attraction in Bowes, Western Australia, is learning the hard way as it tries to shed itself of its haunted reputation. Why would ghosts be such a problem? Because the never-ending hordes of Chinese tour groups tend to stay away from haunted locations. If you're the proprietor of a tourist attraction in Australia, you need every red Mao you can get, and that means the ghosts have to go, real or not. Ukabella Homestead has for years been recognized as one of Australia's most haunted buildings. The homestead was built in 1851 during a time when deadly clashes between white colonists and Australia's indigenous population were common. According to folklore, the Ukabella Homestead and the surrounding territory were the site of many horrific battles between settlers and indigenous peoples, spilling an untold amount of blood upon the very ground where the homestead was built and defended. While that macabre history and rumored present-day haunting was once a large draw for the historical attraction, today the site's business owners Belinda Turner and Brian Snelson think the ghostly reputation needs to go. Not everyone is into ghosts, and that was definitely portrayed in the Facebook comments," Turner told ABC. People will not come here if they think it's haunted, so that's why we are bringing it back to the history. Instead of its ghostly legacy, the site will now focus on its historical accuracy, which its owners claim gives a glimpse into what life was like for early settlers in the 1800s. While a Chinese tourist-oriented rebranding might be necessary to keep the business afloat, you have to wonder what'll happen to all the restless spirits who depend on that tourist income. Is it time for a universal basic ghost income? Ghosts are people too. Uh, were. At any rate, the most important question is whether it's worth it to give up haunted reputations and legends in order to reel in a few more Chinese tour groups. Is no local folklore resilient enough to withstand the forces of capitalism or globalization how many other legendary hauntings have been lost to history as buildings and historical sites attempt to shed the haunted label in favor of cash? An incident took place on the night of April 15, 2013 and it has bothered my family and I since. We live in Portland, Oregon. That night, my mother had a very bad respiratory illness. She woke in what she described was like a drug-induced stupor. She saw blurry images of what appeared to be people in full surgical dress. One of the doctors called her by name, told her everything would be fine. She recalls a needle being inserted in her arm and blood was taken. She was unable to speak and was very confused before she passed out. The next morning, she woke up. She saw a needle mark in her arm and became very upset. My stepfather, who was also in bed with her, noticed that he had one as well, which terrified him. My stepfather has a serious phobia of needles. When he sees the doctor, he has to be sedated before they can insert any sort of needle into him. He literally throws up and passes out on seeing needles. He often must leave the room when blood is taken from my mother. 
He remembered nothing, but was feeling very drowsy and confused. They both came in and asked me if I had let paramedics in the night before. I was wary of their question and told them no. That night, I'd been surfing the internet. Since I was working a graveyard shift at the time, I had only woken up at about 8 p.m. Yet, after two hours of being awake, I suddenly was overcome with such drowsiness and exhaustion I crawled back into my bed and slept on. I fell asleep within minutes, which was very strange. I woke up feeling sore all over, which was weird, but no puncture or needle marks on my arms at all. I had no recollection of anything the night before. When they both showed me these strange needle marks, I was intrigued. They told me that they had fallen asleep suddenly, probably around the same time I did, judging by what was on TV when they fell asleep. What was even more bizarre is that my cats were very spooked the next day. This was very interesting as my largest cat never gets spooked. Vacuum cleaners, dogs, loud sounds, nothing phases him. Yet I found him hiding under a bunch of boxes, and he hissed at me each time I tried to reach in and get him. The other cats were terrified and hiding all through the house. My stepfather also told me the door was unlocked. I remember him locking the door every night. We lived in a bad neighborhood and always made sure it was locked. We have been puzzled over it for these past five years, and I've done a lot of research. I can't seem to find any possible explanations. Although I have always been interested in the UFO phenomenon, it seems that the alien abduction theory was not a serious question. However, as I conduct more research, I have become a bit more confused. I've been reluctant to submit a report to any of the agencies. I found your name on Google and decided to write to you. What happened to us? I'm really interested in getting to the bottom of this high strangeness. I need an answer. I'd like to tell you about an experience I had in 1954 while working with the U.S. naval engineers at Zaragoza Air Base in Zaragoza, Spain. This was to be a refurbished NATO facility. I was a contractor, 24 years old and working my father's construction firm, and I was hired by the DoD. This was my first time away from the United States. I had another fellow with me who had worked for my father for a couple of years. Only a few people knew of my experience, my wife, who is deceased, and two close friends who have also passed away. After I'd been in Spain for several weeks, I decided to take in the surroundings. I was told by some of the locals that the Monasterio de Piedra near Nuevelos would be an excellent place to visit. The monastery was about 60 miles away, so I decided it would be an enjoyable day trip. When I arrived, I met a young lady who offered to show me around the complex. It was a very hot day, early August, so we took numerous breaks along the way. As the afternoon waned and the early evening approached, it was time for me to head back towards Zaragoza. The young lady mentioned that there was a very nice inn not far from the monastery if I wanted to stay the night then get an early start in the morning. So I decided to stay the night, maybe do some exploring that evening. The inn was very rustic, though quite comfortable. I had dinner outside on the back patio. It was an excellent evening. Though it was dusk, I could see the terrain not far from the inn. There was a vineyard and a small lavender meadow behind the inn which led to a series of rocky outcrops. I thought that I would take a look around, but I first asked the owner if it was okay to do so. I walked through the vineyard and reached a small pond which had a loud chorus of frogs. By this time it was dark, but there was a fair amount of available moonlight, but I still needed a flashlight to see where I was going. I walked around the pond and started to cross a small bridge over a narrow stream. As I walked over the bridge, I noticed something run through the water about 50 feet upstream. There was enough moonlight to where I could make out an upright shape. 
this thing was heading towards the high rocks, though I lost sight of it. I stood silent for about five minutes. It was eerie because the frogs were now quiet. The only sound was coming from the direction of the rocks, and the noise was very strange. It sounded like a guttural yak, yak, yak series that would pause a few seconds and then repeat. It would also fade in and out. After a few minutes, it stopped. I had no idea what it was. I crossed the bridge and started to slowly approach the rocks. As I came to the rock face, there was a fairly well-worn trail on the ground along the edge. I walked further until I reached an opening in the rock face. I pointed the flashlight inside and saw that it was a grotto about 15 feet deep and high enough for me to stand in. The floor of the grotto was littered with small animal bones, so I figured that there were predators about, most likely fox. I continued on the trail until I heard the yak, yak, yak sound again, and it was very close. I instantly stopped walking and started searching around me with a flashlight. Just then, some gravel landed on me, and the loud yak, yak, yak sound was coming from directly above me. I quickly looked up and pointed the flashlight. There was a creature standing on a small ledge about 15 feet away, staring at me with yellow eyes reflecting back. It was screaming yak, yak, yak in quick, constant rhythm. This was the most ghastly thing I've ever witnessed. It was standing on two legs. It was about four or five feet tall. I've read about reptilian encounters. Well, I think this may have been one. It was dark in color and had arms like a human. The face looked like that of a lizard, resembling that of an iguana. After a few seconds, it leaped off the ledge onto the trail, swiftly running on two legs in the opposite direction. It was then that I noticed a long tail as it moved away from me. I quickly made my way back toward the inn and directly to my room. I laid in bed thinking about this creature the entire night. I was terrified to look out my window, fearing that it followed me back to the inn. Early in the morning, I checked out and drove back to Zaragoza. I have no proof of my experience other than my word, but I now believe that this was a reptilian creature. In the mid-90s, actually it was November 21, 1995, I was working at the Bull Arm site in Newfoundland, Canada, working on the Hibernia project. I was staying on site as it was an hour and a half drive home. During the day, a name popped into my head, Nick Adonitis, around 2.30 in the afternoon. It actually repeated in my head for about half an hour. You know, like when a song gets stuck in your head? Well, that's the way the name played over and over again. I thought I was cracking up, developing schizophrenia. I was thinking, why the hell is this name in my head? You see, this name was a TV character's name that came from a long-running Canadian show called The Beachcombers, but the show had been off the air for about five years at this point. And I hadn't watched the show since I was a little girl in the 70s, so I couldn't understand why this name was in my head. But for that half hour at work, it was. And after that half hour, it just disappeared, and I continued on working. After work, I went up to the camp and had my evening meal and went back to my room. I turned on the TV and the news was on. The headline was, Bruno Garusi, star of the Beachcombers, passed away today at around 2.30 p.m. My blood ran cold. I had goosebumps, as Bruno Garusi's character on The Beachcombers was, you guessed it, Nick Adonitis. Coincidence? I'd like to add nothing has happened to me like this since that day. When Weird Darkness Returns, it was John Wilkes Booth who assassinated President Abraham Lincoln, but Booth had an assassin as well coming after him. That story is up next. (laughs) 
Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. April 26, 1865. John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of President Abraham Lincoln, was surrounded by Federal troops in a barn near Port Royal, Virginia, and shot to death. Legends persisted for decades, starting almost from the time the fatal shot was fired and continuing to this day, that Booth was not the man who died in that barn. Allegedly, he lived on for many years, only to eventually die in Enid, Oklahoma. But that's a story for another time. As for Booth's death, we'll be taking a closer look at the man who killed him, a very strange gentleman named Boston Corbett, who may have been part of a larger conspiracy himself. Boston Corbett is largely considered to have been the Jack Ruby of his day, the man who killed the killer of the President of the United States. Jack Ruby's shooting of Lee Harvey Oswald on November 24, 1963, in the basement of the Dallas, Texas jail, was witnessed by reporters, police officers, and a national television audience. But Boston Corbett's shooting of John Wilkes Booth on April 26, 1865, at a tobacco farm near Port Royal, Virginia, was hardly witnessed by anyone, and it attracted controversy from the beginning. While he was celebrated for a short time as Booth's killer, his real place in the Lincoln assassination remains in question after all these years. Sergeant Boston Corbett had been assigned to Lieutenant Edward Doherty, one of the Federal officers that had been given the task of tracking down Lincoln's assassin. The soldiers found several witnesses who recognized Booth and eventually discovered a sympathizer, Willie Jett, who had arranged lodging for Booth at the tobacco farm where he was later discovered. It was Corbett who fired the fatal bullet that killed Booth, and it is at this point that many conspiracy theories about him begin. Among the theories is the idea that Corbett was under different orders than the other soldiers. Some believe he was actually told to silence Booth so that Edwin Stanton could not be implicated in a plot against the president. It is unlikely that this was the case, though, as Corbett is not believed to have had contact with Stanton before leaving Washington. He did act on orders to kill Booth. However, if not orders from government officials, then from a higher authority. He shot Booth on direct orders from God. He was born Thomas H. Corbett in London in 1832 and immigrated with his parents to Troy, New York seven years later. As a young man in the 1850s, Corbett went into the hat-making industry at a time when the dire occupational hazards of the trade had yet to be discovered. As he worked, he was exposed to large quantities of mercury, which often caused insanity, thus the expression mad as a hatter. The inescapable inhaling of the vapors from the mercury affected the brain and caused hallucinatory episodes, twitches and tics, and outright psychoses, and his work as a hat-maker was certainly the root of Boston Corbett's madness. He worked in the trade in Troy and Albany, in Richmond, Virginia, and in Boston and New York City for several years. He said to have married during this period, losing his wife and a baby during childbirth. After this tragedy, he became homeless and began drinking. He eventually strayed into religion after attending a revival meeting in New York. In 1857, while working in Boston, Corbett was baptized, apparently into the Methodist Church, 
and the experience so moved him that he adopted the name of the city where he found his faith as his own. He was by now a local eccentric. He wore his hair long because images of Jesus showed him with long locks, and he preached to any passerby who paused in curiosity. Corbett's religious fanaticism, loud but harmless, took a violent turn in the summer of 1858. After a revival meeting at a Boston church, he was propositioned on the street by two prostitutes. The experience so disturbed him that he returned to the boarding house where he lived and castrated himself with a pair of scissors. He was treated at Massachusetts General Hospital from the middle of July to the first weeks in August for his self-inflicted wound. What happened to Boston Corbett over the course of the next two years is unknown, but at some point he returned to New York and in April 1861 enlisted as a private in Company I, 12th New York Militia. Behavioral problems marred his record from the start. They began when he heard Colonel Butterfield, commander of the militia regiment, using profanity toward his new recruits. Corbett reprimanded the colonel for using the Lord's name in vain, and for this was marched off to the guardhouse. A few days later, Butterfield offered to release him if he apologized, but Corbett refused. Corbett later re-enlisted, this time in Company L, 16th New York Cavalry, where he was promoted to corporal and later rose to the rank of sergeant. This was in spite of the numerous disciplinary problems that he had over his demand that officers not use profanity and his condemnation of fellow soldiers who drank. New York cavalrymen remembered their odd comrade for his periodic punishment tours where he carried a knapsack filled with bricks around the guardhouse but his commanders saw him as a fierce and resolute fighting man. He fought bravely in battle, although his odd and erratic behavior often made his superiors wary of using him for some assignments. In June 1864, Confederate raiders under John Singleton Mosby cornered a squad of Union troopers, including Corbett, at Culpeper Courthouse in Virginia. Corbett refused to surrender found cover and opened fire on Mosby and his 26 raiders. He only gave up after his ammunition ran out. Mosby was impressed. Corbett and his comrades were sent to the notorious Andersonville Prison in Georgia and endured five months of incarceration there, three of them in an outdoor compound. He was released during a prisoner exchange in November 1864 and was sent to an army hospital in Maryland to recover from exposure malnutrition, and scurvy. By the early spring of 1865, Corbett had reunited to his unit, and in April was the first man to volunteer for service in the pursuit of President Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. Corbett was among the men who cornered Booth and David Harold at the Port Royal Tobacco Barn, and he was stationed at a point on the building's perimeter when it was set on fire. Through a gap in the barn's siding, he saw a lone figure inside. He stated at the conspiracy trial one month later that he had never seen Booth before, but the man in the barn had a broken leg and made desperate replies to the federal officers who demanded his surrender. He gave a statement on May 1, 1865 that read, I saw Booth in the act of stooping or springing and concluded he was going to use his weapons. I immediately took steady aim upon him with my revolver and fired shooting him through the neck and head. He was then carried out of the barn before the fire reached him, was taken to the piazza of the house. Lieutenant Doherty and the detective officers who were in front of the barn did not seem to know that I had shot him but supposed he had shot himself until I informed Lieutenant Doherty of the fact, showing him my pistol which bore evidence of the truth of my statement, which was also confirmed by the man placed at my right hand who saw it. Corbett's shot was an extraordinary one considering the distance, the weapon, the smoke and fire in the barn, and the confusion that was occurring outside of it. The bullet struck the man inside in the back of the head, almost at the same place where Booth's bullet struck Lincoln, and severed his spinal cord. The assassin was dragged from the burning barn and placed on a mattress from the nearby Garrett house. He was scarcely recognizable as the handsome actor. The man was filthy, his hair in tangles, and eleven-day growth of beard on his emaciated face. He died a few minutes after being taken from the barn. After the shooting at the farm, 
Corbett was placed under arrest by Colonel Conger, Doherty's superior officer in the search party. The charge against him was a breach of military discipline in firing without Doherty's order and in defiance of General Baker's order, and Corbett was placed under guard along with David Harold and returned to Washington. When they arrived, Corbett was imprisoned, awaiting court-martial. However, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, upon hearing the story of the incident, ordered Corbett to be released. He announced theatrically, the rebel is dead, the patriot lives, the patriot is released. Corbett mustered out of the Army on August 17, 1865, and moved to Danbury, Connecticut. There he found work, again in the hat trade, and supplemented his income with occasional lectures accompanied by lantern slides on his exploits as Lincoln's Avenger. But was he really? Even those who did not question the idea that the assassin died at the Garrett farm, they did wonder whether or not Corbett actually fired the fatal shot or whether Booth committed suicide or escaped. Some believed that Colonel Conger fired the shot from the corner of the barn. He received a suspiciously high $15,000 of the combined $75,000 reward offered for Booth and Harold's capture. Others believed that Lieutenant Doherty had done the shooting and pointed out that he received $5,250 of the reward money and was never questioned during the conspirators' trial. Corbett's shot was almost impossible, and many believed that he simply could not have done it. In 1903, an early Lincoln assassination researcher, David M. DeWitt, wrote that Corbett was at least 30 feet from the barn when the shot was fired that killed Booth. In the end, Corbett received $1,653.85 as part of the reward for bringing Booth to justice. His petition for federal pension for his service in the Army, specifically for his work as a volunteer in the search for Lincoln's assassin, came through in 1882. He was granted $7.50 a month in appreciation for his service to the United States. Corbett eventually gave up work as a hat maker and showed up in the late 1860s in Camden, New Jersey, where he worked as a minister. He later went west and ended up in Kansas in the 1870s, showing signs of a deteriorating mental state. He lived as a reclusive farmer for years, occasionally working as a fire and brimstone evangelist. In November 1885, he was arrested after threatening some boys playing baseball on the Sabbath with a pistol. The case was dismissed by the county attorney. A year after this incident, through the efforts of the Grand Army of the Republic and a state legislator from Cloud County where Corbett lived, he was hired as an assistant doorkeeper at the Kansas House of Representatives in Topeka. He reported for duty in January 1887, but only lasted a month before his insanity got the better of him. Corbett, in his madness, believed that the other doorkeepers and the politicians were laughing at him behind his back. This led to him threatening a janitor with a knife and then pointing a revolver at the House Sergeant-in-Arms. He broke into the House gallery with his weapons, causing the lawmakers, staff, and workers to flee for their lives. Corbett was quickly arrested and taken before a judge the next day. A quick verdict was pronounced and he was sent to the Topeka Asylum for the Insane. He failed on his first attempt to escape, but on May 26, 1888, he succeeded. Walking around the grounds of the asylum with other inmates that day, Corbett saw a pony that belonged to the young son of the superintendent tied up in front of the hospital office. He hurried over, stole the horse, and rode away. A week later, with flyers posted about him around the state, Corbett surfaced in Neodesha in the southeastern part of the state. There he met a local schoolmaster named Richard Thatcher and Erwin Ford, the son of a soldier who had been imprisoned with Corbett at Andersonville. The two men supplied Corbett with a fresh horse, food, and money. They said that Corbett told them that he had been shamefully treated and intended to flee to Mexico. He may have done just that, although we'll never know for sure. He was in good health when he escaped from the hospital, and Mexico was the perfect place for him to do just what he did – disappear. Thanks for listening. 
If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And please leave a rating and review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to audiobooks I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Popular Australian tourist attraction has a ghost problem was written by Brent Tingley for Mysterious Universe. What Happened to Us is from RJ at PhantomsAndMonsters.com. Reptile Confrontation was written by H.Y. Nick Adonitis was written by Joanne Noseworthy and submitted directly to WeirdDarkness.com. Angel of Death – Inside the Mind of a Serial Child Killer was written by Carissa Chisinek for the lineup, and The Man Who Murdered the Assassin was written by Troy Taylor. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And a final thought, every day you choose not to face your fear, you feed your fear. John Peacock. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.